In this episode, we're focusing on London's skyscrapers, and the skyline is something that has changed dramatically and continues to develop over the last 30 years. Now, you might think looking at these brand spanking new buildings that there's very little history to talk about, but as ever, there is always a way that this history creeps in. In the episode, we're going to be focusing on some of the skyscrapers within the city of London, an area that's sometimes referred to as the Eastern Cluster, although that is due for a rebrand as well. If you're new, my name's Katie. I'm a qualified London Blue Badge tourist guide and I run walking tours across the city, really designed for Londoners. So if you want to join some of my public walks, all the information is linked in the description. Now, the City of London is only about a square mile in area. It's the oldest part of London and was founded by the Romans as Londinium about 2000 years ago. Today, the City of London is a world leading financial centre, so it does require modern high spec office space. However, because of all the historic provenance, buildings like St Paul's Cathedral, the Tower of London and the monuments, there are sections which are preserved um, that you cannot build on. One of the earlier bits of legislation of this is the 19th century London Building Acts, which decreed that a new building couldn't be taller than a fireman's ladder, which, in case you're wondering, is about 10 storeys high. Then, from the 1930s, the City of London introduced measures called St Paul's Heights, which meant that no tall buildings could be built around the vicinity of St Paul's Cathedral. After the bomb damage of the Second World War, further areas of the city were placed in conservation zones, and then there were eight viewing corridors protecting the long-distance views of St Paul's, as well as some of the other further controls and listed buildings. This meant that actually there's only a very small section of the City of London which allows tall buildings, hence this eastern cluster. The tall building boom started with the NatWest Tower. It's named after its occupiers, National Westminster Bank, and it stands at 183 metres, around 600 foot, designed by Richard Seifert, and was formally opened 1981 by Her Majesty the Queen. At the time, it was the tallest building in the UK, until in 1990, One Canada Square arrived in Canary Wharf. But a sneaky detail, just close to the base of Tower 42, can be seen at the entrance of Adams Court, just off Threadneedle Street. Look up and you can spot the letters NPB that's seen in the ironwork. This was established 1883, the National Provincial Bank, and it merged with Westminster Bank in 1968 to form NatWest. So this is a reminder of the early headquarters. Next we have everybody's favourite, the Gherkin, officially 30 St Mary Axe and formerly home of Swiss Ray. It opened in 2004, standing at 180 metres or 591 foot tall, and was designed by Norman Foster. And the site that it occupies used to be that of the Baltic Exchange, destroyed in a bomb attack by the provisional IRA in 1992. If you're one of the few that doesn't like the gherkin, perhaps it's the lesser of two evils, as the provisional plan was for a 92-storey London Millennium Tower. Also designed by Foster and Partners, this would have stood at 386 metres. That's almost 80 metres taller than the Shard today. In 1996, when plans were unveiled, a Guardian article described it as looking like an erotic gherkin, which is probably why we have the same nickname for the current building today. Now, when you're next at the gherkin, it's well worth looking at ground level, because you can see these modern stone seats, and they tell us about a Roman connection. When the foundations were being dug, extraordinary discovery, that of the body of a Roman girl aged between 13 and 17, and the Museum of London Archaeology team think that she was alive around 350 to 400 AD. 
Once the building was finished, the girl was reburied in the city of London and a plaque today marks the site. But what about the weird address, St Mary Axe? This comes from a church and a street near the site. If we look at the Agus map from the mid 16th century, we can see both the church and the street highlighted here. As you'd expect, there are plenty of St Mary's churches, and so the axe part sets it apart. And there are a few theories as to this odd name. John Stowe tells us in 1603 that it comes from a sign of an axe on the east end of the church. Another document, this time from the early 1500s, says in fact it was a relic of a real axe inside the church that was used to slaughter 11,000 virgins. This is a story related to Saint Ursula, if you'd like to read up more about that. Thirdly, it's quite possible that it was just named after a pub tavern called the Axe that used to stand nearby. If you've seen my videos about London's strange street names, it was not uncommon for street names to be named after pubs. The church was demolished around 1561 and the congregation merged with the nearby St Andrew Undershaft. And this brings us to our next skyscraper, the Leadenhall Building, aka the Cheese Grater. At number 122 Leadenhall Street, this street is named after a medieval lead roofed hall that also gives us the name of the wonderful Leadenhall Market nearby. Standing at 225 metres, around 738 foot, this was designed by Rogers, Sturck, Harbour and Partners. So why the odd shape? Well, it all comes back to St Paul's Cathedral. The building literally leans out of the way in order to preserve the view of the dome from Fleet Street. And cheese grater, I hear you ask? Exhibit A, it's pretty much all down to the shape. As you can see, it looks very similar to a cheese grater. One theory supported by the Londonist is that this started with Ruth Rogers, a chef and the wife of Richard Rogers, one of the partners in the architect firm. But back to Undershaft, this is still a street name that survives today. And if you look at the base of the cheese grater, you'll see this odd multicolored pole this is a reminder of the Maypole, something Londoners would happily frolic around on specific feast days. Now, these festivities were banned in 1517, but before then, the huge pole, or shaft, overshadowed the church nearby, hence the name Undershaft. Today, St Andrew Undershaft is still overshadowed, but this time by the Gherkin. Speaking of overshadowing, let's look at the tallest building in the city of London, 22 Bishopsgate. This name comes from one of the Roman gateways in and out of their city, Londinium. The Bishopsgate was destroyed in 1760. At the base of 22 Bishopsgate, you'll find the wonderful St Helen's Church. This is a medieval relic. It was a nunnery and a parish church, and it survived both the Great Fire of London and the Blitz, only to then be severely damaged and later restored after the same bomb that hit the Baltic Exchange. It's a wonderful place to visit, and William Shakespeare himself was even a parishioner when he lived nearby. Now, if we look at this section of the recreated Tudor map, from layers of London. You can see St Helen's Priory as well as a place called Crosby Place in the bottom left hand corner and this is roughly on the site of 22 Bishopsgate today. This was a luxurious manor house built in 1466 and it survived in the city of London until 1910 when it was moved piece by piece over to Cheney Walk in Chelsea, where you can still see it today. Unfortunately, it is a private home, so you can't really go inside to visit. And although it has been much altered, a lot of the fabric, including the Great Hall, survives from the 15th century. 
By the way, there's no official nickname yet for 22 Bishop's Gate. There have been calls of the wodge, i.e. a wodge of cash, but if you have any better examples, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Finally, we come to the villain of our story today. As a tour guide, I tend to try and be impartial, but I have to say I am not a huge fan of the walkie-talkie, aka 20 Fenchurch Street. This nickname is on account of its distinctive top-heavy shape that resembles a vintage 1980s mobile phone. To be fair, it does have the saving grace of Sky Garden, which was designed as a public park and it is free to visit, although you will have to pre-book a ticket. And it is a lovely place to have a glass of wine and look over the view of London, mainly because the walkie-talkie doesn't feature on the skyline. Anyway, Raphael Vanoli was the designer and the whole construction before it was even finished became infamous in 2013 when the whole structure became a dangerous laser beam. During construction, the concave front of the building reflected the sun's glare onto East Cheap below. In the line of the death ray was unfortunately a parked Jaguar owned by Martin Lindsay, who later reported that parts of the car, the wing mirror, bumper and badge had melted. Today, if you look up at the front, there are these additional black slats to stop this happening. The architect admitted that he thought reflection was possible, might be an issue, but he didn't realize it was going to be so hot. The building has predictably been since dubbed as the Walkie Scorchy. In terms of history, there are two fun things to spot on East Cheap, underneath the looming facade of the Walkie Talkie. If you look to numbers 33 to 35, we have this heavily restored Victorian frontage. But look closely and you'll see a sculpture of a boar's head. This is a reference to the Boar's Head Tavern, mentioned in William Shakespeare's Henry IV Part I. It was rebuilt after the Great Fire of London, but the tavern was finally demolished in 1831. Around the corner is another curious sculpture on Philpot Lane. Quite possibly the tiniest public sculpture in London, look up to spot two mice eating a lump of cheese. The story behind this, most probably just an urban myth, is that two workmen, whilst the building was being constructed in the 19th century, got into a fight, one claiming the other stole his cheese sandwich. Another version of this story is that these were actually 17th century builders working on the nearby monument. But in either case, the ensuing heated argument resulted in pushing and shoving until one, or sometimes both, tumbled off the building to their death. After the incident, it was discovered that actually a mouse had stolen the sandwich, hence these little creatures nibbling on the piece of cheese. So there you go, with even the most recent buildings in London, there is still history to be found all around us. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next week for more of London's hidden history.